Amen. It's now time for our children's church. If our kids want to head on out, now is the time when they'll be leaving. And as they're leaving, I've got a card that I uh, failed to read earlier I want to share with you. It says, Dear Liberty Point Church, God bless you with the same peace, hope, and love that you bring to the lives of others. We want to thank each, of, each one of you that came to see us while Bill was sick. Thanks for all the calls and your prayers. We love each one of you. God bless. Love, Juan Dean and family. It's certainly good to have Brother Billy and Miss Wandine uh, with us this morning and glad, glad he is feeling better. If you brought your Bibles this morning, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2 is where we will pick up this morning. We've been working our way through the book of Philippians and this morning we'll, we'll finish up chapter 2. So Philippians chapter 2 starting in verse 19. And once you find your place there, I invite you to stand with me if you're able. As we honor the reading of God's word, Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 19. It says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me, and I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow, fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need, for he has been longing for you all as has been, as, and has been distressed because uh, you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death, but God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but also on me, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for this time that we have to be able to come together and to be in your house. And Lord, what a privilege it is, Father, to be able to come and to worship you as we have today. And Father, now to turn and to, to hear from you. And God, that is our true desire this morning. God, we don't need to hear another sermon. But God, what we desperately need this morning is to hear from you. So God, we pray that you would speak to our hearts and let us leave here changed because of what you have to say to us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. I was reading uh, recently about a church in, in New Mexico, actually. It's a small c country church. It has one entrance, uh, one entrance and one exit for the church. And right above the door there at this church, it says servant's entrance. Um, it was just, a, just used for this church as a reminder that, that we all come as servants, right? Uh, none of us are here this morning because... We, we came to be served, but we are truly servants of the Lord. Paul here in, in the end of chapter 2 is talking about two men who are definitely, without a doubt, servants of the Lord. These are men who uh, exemplify uh, what Paul has talked about previously uh, in, in his letter. If you go back and, and read chapter 1 and, and chapter 2 up to this point, you remember that Paul has given example after example of, of things that we as Christians should, should have in our lives, things that we should be doing, the way that we should be living. And then he gives us this great example of Christ as the one who is the perfect example uh, of all these characteristics combined. But then he kind of gives us a, a, a glimpse of what it might look like for us as humans, right, as uh, followers of Christ to be able to live this out, what it might look like for you and for me. And so he uses the example of Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now we'll, we'll talk a little bit about each one of these as we go through these, but we'll start with Timothy. Now, Timothy, of course, was uh, uh, someone who Paul considered his son in the faith, and we even see that example here as, as we go through these verses, but, but Paul was the one who was able to, to share the gospel with Timothy. Timothy was certainly important to him. He wrote a couple of letters to Timothy as Timothy was, was leading churches later in his life. 
Uh, Timothy was, a, was definitely a young man as he became a pastor. Most, uh, most people believe that Timothy was about 30 years old when he, when he started pastoring, which was extremely young uh, for, for that day. Still extremely young, I might add. <laughs> uh, Mr. Sammy uh, called me out this morning. He said, how old are you, Paxton? 40, 45, 50? I said, I said, Mr. Sammy, I'm 33. Uh, so still very extremely young. Uh, and, and so <laughs> we, uh, uh, we, we, we learn a little bit more about Timothy uh, in, in those books that are, that are written or in those letters that are written directly to Timothy. And so Timothy uh, was uh, the son of a Jewish mother uh, who became a Christian and a Gentile father. Uh, Timothy uh, was, was brought up in, in a believing home. We read that uh, later. So, so Paul here, uh, as described by himself, is a Hebrew among Hebrews. He is the Jewest of the Jews, as he would call himself. He said, there's no one more Jewish than me. And yet he writes this letter to Timothy, or he, he, he's sending Timothy here, who is the son of a Jewish Christian mother and a uh, Gentile father. So that's a, a little bit of the background on Timothy here. He says, I hope in the Lord, verse 19, to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Now what, an, what a picture here of who Timothy was. He, he says that, that no one will be more concerned about you than Timothy is. He said, I, I know lots of people who would probably be concerned, but he said, no one's going to be more concerned about you than Timothy will. That tells us a little bit about Timothy's character, and I think it tells us a little bit about the character that we should strive to have with one another as well. You remember back earlier, Paul has talked about the importance of unity and placing others' needs above yourself. And then he comes to Timothy and he says, here's a guy who I promise you, no one will be more concerned about you than Timothy is. I wonder if we could say that about one another this morning. Say, so I, I know that those folks at church, I, I know that they care about me more than anybody else. What if we as a church exemplified that character about the people in our community? What if it was known in, the, in our community that, man, Liberty Point cares about people more than anybody else? I can promise you that. That's what Paul says about Timothy. What a characteristic to have that no one will care about you more than Timothy will. And I, I, I long to be known like Timothy was known here. That, man, he just genuinely cares about people. Not only does he care about them, he cares about them more than anybody else could care about them. We were uh, talking with our kids about, about different things at one point in time, and, and, and I told one of the girls, I said, I, I want you to know, I said, I believe in you more than anybody else does. And she looked at me and she said, even mom? <laughs> I, maybe, maybe even. <laughs> I said, no, I, I said, we both, we both care about you. And I said, we, we really believe in you. Well, what if we as the church had that idea about our community? We, we genuinely cared about our community. So much so that they said, you know what? They, I, I don't think that's just a show. I, I don't think they're just doing this. They genuinely care about us and they are genuinely concerned for our welfare. Look at verse 21. He says, for they all seek their own interest and not those of Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul says of Timothy, the reason that he cares about you so much is because he put his own interests to the side. He's not seeking to serve himself, but the reason that he cares about you is because he is concerned about your relationship with the Lord, and he puts his own interests to the side. Now, we all know that uh, in our world today, most people think everyone has an agenda, right? That, that, that no one comes with, without that agenda. We all have things that we're trying to get and, and trying to make happen, but not true of Timothy. Timothy's not seeking anything about himself. He's put his own interests to the side and made the interest of others more important than himself. Again, go back, go back and read chapter 2. You'll find that this is exactly what Paul was trying to show us as an example uh, of how we should live our lives. And so he said Timothy puts his own interest to the side. He doesn't have an agenda. Church, how, how fresh would that be in our world today for people just to do something because it's the right thing to do instead of having an agenda and, and trying to, 
to, to work their, their agenda in, in doing good things. Just doing the right thing because it's the right thing. Man, what a guy Timothy must have been. Verse 22, he goes on describing Timothy. He said, but you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served me in the gospel. Again, we see this picture of how important Timothy is and how Timothy has been Paul's right-hand man, so to speak. Again, let me remind you, Paul's writing this letter from prison, and so Timothy has, has uh, been able to do so many different things for him and has truly uh, been, been a servant to Paul here. And he says, I hope therefore to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me, and I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. So he says, Timothy is a servant that puts others above himself and has a genuine concern for people. Timothy's example number one this morning of what we as believers, as followers of Christ, must look like. You see, church, we must be servants. There is no room for anything else here at the church. We've got to all come seeking to serve and seeking to do what God has called us to do. We want to be servants of the Lord, but we also want to make sure that we put others above ourselves, that we are concerned about them so much so, and, and that we, we put their interests above our own and, and, uh, and focus on, on the Lord instead of ourselves. And what a, what a contradiction to our culture today it would be to have people who have a genuine concern for other people, put others' interest above their own, and are willing to be servants. You know, there's a funny thing about servants. Most of the time, they don't go down in history, do they? They, they, they kind of get forgotten about. Nobody remembers them. Well, tell that to Timothy. People are still talking about him. Tell that to Epaphroditus, who we get to next. If Timothy was uh, the son of a Jewish mother and a Gentile father, Epaphroditus was the son of two Gentile parents. Uh, so we have this, this spectrum here from Paul being a Hebrew among Hebrews, Jewish through and through, to Timothy, who was a uh, son of a Jewish mother and Gentile father, to Epaphroditus, who was Gentile through and through. And yet, we read this about Epaphroditus. Look at verse 25. I've thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier and your messenger and minister to my need. What exactly does Paul mean when he says your messenger and minister to my need? What, what was he talking about there? You see, the Philippian church, while Paul was in Rome, decided that they were going to help Paul out. They were going to send him some, some, some financial support. And so, of course, they, they just hired Western Union, uh, sent Paul the money. No, they weren't able to do that, right? So they had to have somebody who was willing to make the journey from Philippi to Rome. Not a small journey, not, certainly not a simple one, uh, a journey that took a lot, of, a lot of effort. And so Epaphroditus volunteers. He says, you know what, I'll, I'll be willing to go and, and take our support to Paul to be able to help him out. And so Epaphroditus takes their offering and goes to give it to Paul. But here's what's so amazing about Epaphroditus' story is not only does he take the offering, but he just stays there and begins to work with Paul and to serve him. And so Paul says, I'm sending back Epaphroditus, who was your messenger and the minister to my need. You see, Epaphroditus was yet another person who was a servant at heart. You catch a theme here in these two guys, right? These people are servants first and foremost. They were willing and ready to do whatever it took to make sure that the gospel kept spreading. But I like the description that Paul says of Epaphroditus. First off, he says, he's my brother. You see, when we all trust in Christ, we are truly brothers and sisters in Christ. I'll never forget a story, a great, uh, great illustration. Dr. Russell Moore, who I, I had as a professor in seminary, uh, adopted two sons from Russia. He tells the, this, this great story uh, of his two sons and actually uh, wrote a book about their adoption process, great book called Adopted for Life. Uh, but one of the stories that he shared with us in, in, in our class was that after they brought the two boys home, uh, he said, we, we brought them back to our church. 
And people kept asking the same question. He said, this one lady was really adamant about it, though. She came up to me, and she said, Dr. Moore, are, are they brothers? And he said, oh, yes, ma'am. He said, they're, they're my sons. They're brothers. And she said, oh, well, I, I don't think you understood what I meant. Are they, are they brothers? And he said, yeah, no, yes, ma'am, I, I do understand what you mean. They're my sons. They are brothers. And she goes, oh, his name's Russell Moore. She said, oh, Russ, what I really mean is, are they really brothers? And he said, yes, ma'am, they're my sons. They're really brothers. And Paul describes Epaphroditus, this man who is on the opposite end of the spectrum from him. Paul, who grew up Jewish, educated Jewish, and Epaphroditus, who grew up a Gentile, far from God, and no idea. And yet when Paul describes Epaphroditus, he says, Epaphroditus, my brother. I want to tell you today that they were really brothers. Because you see, they were sons of the Father. And that makes them really brothers. You see, you and I today are brothers and sisters in Christ, not because of anything that we've done, not because of anything that we are, not because uh, of who we were born to, but because of whose child we are. Because Christ paid the price for you and for me. And you see, he makes us children of the Father. That's good news today, that we can truly be brothers and sisters in Christ. And so Paul says, Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker. You see, a servant is one who's willing to get in and, and get after it, willing to work and, and to do his part. But not only are they willing to work, they're willing to fight. Look at the next one, Paul says, and fellow soldier. You see, I think a lot of times we forget that we're a part of something that's going on in the world that's not always easy. I can assure you that there is always a war that is taking place, a war that is taking place for the souls of men. Uh, a, 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 a soldier is one who's not afraid to get in there and fight, not, a, not afraid to take a stand. And Paul says of Epaphroditus, he's a worker, but he's also a soldier. He's willing to fight. And we've already mentioned that he was a messenger and minister to Paul's need. Go ahead to verse 26. He says, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. And indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I, lest I should have had sorrow upon sorrow. Paul, Paul says, I'm sending him to you because he's so concerned about you. He's longing, to, longing for you all, and because he knows that you all heard he was sick. Uh, again, we see here, just like we saw in Timothy, someone who has a desire to, uh, or concern for other people. Church, we have got to have a concern for other people if we truly want to reach this world. If we truly, truly want to reach our community, we've got to have a concern for our community first and foremost. Epaphroditus was longing to get back and to see the people that he cared about and to see how they were doing. I want to ask a, a question that's kind of a dangerous question because I think it's a, a great thermometer for where we're at as a church. But when's the last time you were truly concerned about someone's salvation? I'm not talking about, oh, I'm, I really hope they're saved. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a true, genuine concern that at times leaves you uh, to, to the point of, uh, of, of emotion even. It, when's the last time you were concerned to the point of tears about someone's well-being or someone's salvation. I think in both of these men, Timothy and Epaphroditus, we see this longing and this genuine concern as Paul describes it. And I can't help but wonder if, if we have that same kind of concern for our own community. You see, when you finally get to that point, that's when you'll be willing to do something about it. When we finally get so concerned that it, that it doesn't leave our minds, that's, that's when you're willing to go and, and to talk to someone. Epaphroditus was longing to be back with him. Verse 28, he says, and I am the more eager to send him. Therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. 
So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Paul says that Epaphroditus is not, fr- not afraid to give his life for the gospel. And so Paul says, I, I want you to rejoice in seeing him. I, I, I want him to truly be a blessing, but he says, I want you to also honor such men who are willing to give their life in service to the Lord. See, that little church in New Mexico, I think, had it right. Or at least halfway right. Because I don't think we all come through the servant's entrance. I don't think we all come here this morning with a desire to be a servant. But I do pray that we all go out the servant's exit. Because I pray as we leave here this morning that we leave with a desire to be servants of the Lord, putting others above ourselves and have a genuine concern and a genuine longing to see people come to faith in Christ. I want to close with, a, with an invitation, and I want you to know as we, we come to this time of invitation that, that I'm concerned for those who don't know Christ. And I pray that that's a concern that you share as well. Maybe this morning you just want to come down front and you want to pray for someone who's on your mind. Someone that you're not sure that they know Christ. And maybe this morning you just want to come and and spend time praying for them. You see, I've never yet seen anyone who could save someone else. It's all the work of the Lord. And so let's be burdened for it and let's go to the one that can do something about it. God's the one that can save. So let's go to him and ask God to move in their hearts and in their lives. And yet to move in our hearts and our lives so that we might be servants of him as well. Or maybe this morning you come and you say, Paxton, you know, I, I, I want to be a servant, but I, I don't know how because I've never trusted in Christ as my Savior and Lord. I, I want to have all those things that you, that you talked about. I want to live that kind of life. And so maybe this morning you just want to meet me down front here and, 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 uh, and I'd, I'd be glad to talk with you about where you're at spiritually and, and what God can do in your life. Whatever it is, I just pray that you would be obedient to him and lift up those that God has placed on your heart even while we're praying. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for this time and this opportunity, Lord, to be able to come together and to be in your house. Father, this morning I pray that, Father, even though we may not have all come through the servant's entrance, God, I pray that we would all leave as servants this morning. That, Father, we wouldn't look to our own interest, or Father, have some sort of agenda, but Father, we would come empty hands, Father, longing for you to use us. God, I pray this morning for the ones that you've placed upon our hearts today. God, for those who do not know you, and God, I pray that you would give folks the courage and the boldness to be able to step out and to come down front and to just lift those, those folks up in prayer. God, just such a simple act, Father, could have such a lasting effect. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be obedient to you. Father, yet for the one or for the ones that don't know you, God, I pray that today they would trust in you as their Savior and Lord. Lord, this is your time. We pray that you would use this for your glory and your glory alone. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.